Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so uh, the topic this evening is access granted. Uh, I'm going to be talking about authentication, authorization, identity, and uh, what the options are for enabling those things in the software that you're building. And we'll have a look at some of those and the pros and cons. Um, before I get into that, um, I'll do a bit of an introduction. This is going to be the agenda for the evening. I'll start with the introduction. Um, I'll start by explaining what the terms identity, authentication, and authorization mean. Uh, then we'll talk a bit about sessions and cookies, which is the way that it's been done for a long time. We'll look at OAuth or OAuth 2 more specifically, and tokens and claims, which is how most people are doing it now. Um, and then we'll look at the options for outsourcing identity and seeing how you can use existing services for, uh, for enabling that in your applications. Um, so I'll start with a, a bit of an introduction about myself. My name is Matt Goldman. Um, they call me Goldie around the office here. The reason they call me Goldie is because uh, there's another Matt here who was here when I started. Uh, and there was another Matt at another office. And the way I understand it, they thought that the Matt at the other office spelled his name with one T. This Matt spells his name with two T's. So they were insisting that I would have to spell my name with multiple T's. So they all started calling me Matt, -t 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 -t, um, which Adam uh, hated, so said uh, it's Goldie. So that's what they call me here. You can find me online on Twitter, uh, at Matt Goldman. Uh, I do have a blog, uh, goforgoldman.com. Bit more about myself. So uh, at, here at SSW, I work on uh, .NET, a bit of mobile. As Adam said earlier, I do some Xamarin, a bit of Angular, and a bit of Azure. Outside of work, I like motorcycles. Unlike Adam, my missus still lets me ride mine. <laughs> um, and another bit of trivia about me is I'm an Iron Man. Uh, you may not think it from looking at me. Uh, admittedly, it was a long time ago, but I'm quite happy to rest on my laurels on that one. <laughs> Um, so uh, Adam mentioned earlier the SSW app. Who's just a reminder? Who's got this installed? Okay, so if you would like to install it, you can scan this QR code here. That will take you to the App Store or the Google Play Store to install the app. Uh, there'll be a QR code that I'll show at the end of the talk that you can scan that in the app, and that will give you points. You can ask other SSW employees to show you their personal codes. You can scan those. You can get points. The points can be uh, used for rewards and prizes at SSW. So uh, I'm not going to keep that up, but uh, if anyone wants to install it, you can just search for SSW in the store. Um, OK, so getting into it. So I said I'd start, I'd talk about identity, authentication, and authorization. So let's have a look at what these things mean. So authentication is proving that you are who you say you are. So I've just said I'm Matt Goldman. How do I prove it? Well, the way that we prove it uh, is with a password which is a very, very old technology. It's a very old approach. And the industry is pretty much unanimous in uh, agreement that passwords are not fit for purpose. We haven't yet come up with the next thing. There's lots of all kinds of alternatives, biometrics, um, RFID cards, all kinds of things. Um, but these tend to sit on top of passwords. So we haven't got rid of passwords yet. But authentication is, is proving that your claim that you are who you say you are is authentic. Authorization is what you're allowed to do, what you're authorized to do. So I've said that I'm Matt Goldman. I've proved it. I've authenticated. What am I authorized to do? What does being Matt Goldman give me access to? And where these overlap, these two together kind of form your identity. So your identity is who you are. It's proving who you are. It's what proves who you are. It's what you're allowed to do. Now, don't worry too much about that because identity means much more. This whole topic is identity strictly. So, you know, there's a lot more to it than that, but in a nutshell. Um, does that all make sense? Yeah? Okay, I'd like to look at a, a bit more of a concrete example. So, um, use an, ex an example of a driver's license, right? So, up here we've got your name. That's your identity. That's who you are, okay? Your license number is authentication. This authenticates the license. So this license number can be looked up in the RMS database, and it can be it can be verified, and it can prove that that license is authentic. And here, where it says license class C, that's authorization. So the person with this license is authorized to drive a car. In my case, as I said, I like motorcycles. I have an additional class on there as well. So that's that's your authorization. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. All right, so we now know what authorization are, we, is. We know what identity is. We know what authentication is. Why do we care? Well, as I said, you know, we kind of, 
we get a situation where someone can say that they're so and so person, um, but then let's say you're running an API or a resource that you want to protect. One person says it, another person says it. We need to know which one's authentic. We don't want to end up in a situation like this. This is a tired old trope that we're all sick of. You know, oh no, I'm the real me. Kill, shoot him. You know, no, no, I'm the real one. Shoot him. You know, nobody wants to see that anymore. That's boring now. You know, we certainly don't want to see this. You know, we've had enough of all this stuff. Uh, shoot him, he's choking me. No, shoot him, he's choking me. There's got to be a better way. There's got to be a better way of authenticating people, proving that they are who they say they are. And it's certainly got to be a better way than this. Now then, gentlemen, trim your toenails. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, enough. Okay, <laughs> so how do we do it? How do we do it? So I'm gonna talk a bit about sessions and cookies. This is the way it's been done for a long time. How does this work? Well, you start off, as you always do, with a username and password. You send your username and password to the server. The server authenticates that, verifies that you are who you say you are, generates that page there, and sends it through to you, and your browser then displays it. It also generates a session cookie and sends you that session cookie. Because then next time you want a resource from the server, you don't have to then use your username and password again. Your session cookie contains a session identifier. You just send the identifier to the server, it knows who you are, and then it sends you the resource you're looking for. The way that it does that is it also maintains state on the server side. So everything you do in the application is maintained on the server side as well. Maintains a copy of, it knows exactly what you're doing, who you are, it's an active session, the state is, is maintained. And that session cookie is maintained on the server as well. So that's how cookies work, um, session cookies I should say. Um, so what's good about session cookies? They're simple, they work out the box. Um, we'll see an example of that. Um, you don't really have to do much to make them work if you're using Visual Studio, for example. Um, and cookies sound like a tasty treat. That's nice. Um, what are the downsides? Downsides are that cookies are vulnerable to something called a cross-site request forgery. Uh, that's a bit out of scope of this talk. I'm not going to go into what that is, but, but basically it means that some malicious JavaScript running in a web page can hijack that session and use that session maliciously. And cookies are vulnerable to that. Uh, they're stateful. So as I showed in the previous slide, the server maintains state. So that means that an effect of that is that it's less scalable because it's maintaining all that state. Um, it means that there's, you know, it, it, it incurs a performance overhead which makes it less scalable. Um, and, you know, more jokes, we have to put up with this every time someone talks about cookies. We don't want to see that anymore. So how does it look? How does it work? Well, I'll show you. So. I'm going to switch to Visual Studio here, and I've got an MVC app which I'm just going to fire up. Whilst that's loading, I'll just explain how I did this. So I have, I've built some custom models here, I've done some custom stuff on the pages, but other than that, this is just a next, next finish vanilla Visual Studio solution. So um, I'll tell you a bit more about myself. My background is in health. Before I was working at SSW, worked for a hospital for 10 years. So I thought for this demo, I had the idea of doing a, uh, a medication management system. So this is very basic. As I said, this is just a next, next, finish Visual Studio. We can see here, I've got access to this menu. I can go to patients. I can create a new patient. Let's, uh, let's put Adam in here. Uh, and Adam, as we all know, is very young. So I'll just give him a date of birth from last year sometime. And Great, we've created Adam. So we can go in here, we can also do medications, um, and we can prescribe medications. We've got access to all this. Um, okay, so you can see that it says register and log in. So I can register for this application. I can log in, um, but it's not forcing me to. Uh, okay, well that's good. How do we make it do that? So I'll just kill this off. I've got another version of this one here. Um, where it's exactly the same, except I have made it use authentication. And I'll show you how that works. So if I were to open up one of my controllers, let's say this medications controller here, we all know, hopefully, we all know, that you can go to a method, so let's say uh, this one here, and I can add this authorize on here like that. Who knew that you could do that? Yep, easy, right? That's very easy, you can do that, that will make it authorize that method. So anytime you hit that, it's not gonna let you do it unless you're logged in. 
But that's probably not the way that you want to do it, because really, being logged in should be the default, and it should be the exception to make you not have to be logged in. So you can do that by saying allow anonymous to allow someone not to be have to be logged in. And I'll just fire that up and show you how that works here. And whilst we're doing that, I'll show you how you enable that across the whole application. So using the middleware here, and just in my startup, all I've done is I've added this MVC policy here. And I've just said authorization policy builder require authenticated user. And now allow anonymous is the exception and authorize is the default. Now I'm already logged in here um, because my session is saved. So I'm logged in here as doctor, if I just log out. You can see now that if I click home, if I click any of these things, because I'm not logged in, it's redirecting me to the login page. Again, I haven't done that. This is all just done for me out of the box. So if I just log in again, I'm logging in with a, a, an account that I've created here. And now that I'm logged in, I now have access to what I was going, going for. So again, I can get to the patients, I can get to the medications, and so on and so forth. That's really all there is to it. Um, I've created another dummy account here, which I'll just show you. Um, nurse at sswmedical.com. And I'm going to type in my super secure password. OK, so I'm now logged in as a nurse. I can see some patients here. Let's add a medication. Um, I'm just going to add paracetamol because it's in there already. OK, great. So we've now got a medication. Um, by the way, if there are any pharmacists or doctors or nurses in here this evening, um, if, if at any point throughout this demo you see me looking like I'm going to prescribe a lethal dose to someone, please let me know. Um, so we've got, we've got a patient. We've got a medication. Let's prescribe them. Ah. OK. So I can't actually now get to prescribe medications. I can look at the prescriptions that are there, but I can't, I can't prescribe a new one. Well, the way that that works is because if I look at my prescriptions controller here, yes, I've got authorized across everything across the board now. Um, but what I've done is I've put this where it says authorized roles equals doctor. So now for the create method, and this, by the way, is uh, because it's MVC, this is the method that returns the view. This is the actual method where the data gets posted to. Both of those I've got authorized, roles equals doctor. So now I've got user logins enabled, I've got uh, passwords, and I've got roles, and this is all just done with me having to do next to nothing. So that's all pretty straightforward, right? OK, so we've had a look at that. Uh, slide. So we've had a look at a demo. We've had a look at uh, we've had a look at MVC. We've had a look at how it works using sessions and cookies. Um, let's look at how it's done now. So as I said, it's now done with OAuth tokens and claims. I'll show you a little bit about how that works. So to start with, it's a username and password, as it always is, right? You send your username and password to the server. This time, the server doesn't generate the page for you. It doesn't generate any views. What it does is it generates something called a token. In this case, it's a JSON web token. And this, by the way, is the actual official logo of the JSON web token. Um, and it sends the token back. Right. So now you have a token stored locally. And when you want to access data, you send, for example, here an HTTP uh, GET request, and you attach that token to the request. That goes up to the server. The server looks at that token and it validates it. It says, yes, that token is valid. It then returns data. Uh, so not a page, not a view. It returns data. And your client renders that locally. So we're going to talk about JSON web tokens. I just want to be clear that uh, the OAuth 2 standard doesn't require that you use a JSON web token. There are, in fact, other kinds of token that you can use but you'd be very unlikely to come across those ever. Uh, no one is really using any other kinds of tokens. But the standard doesn't mandate, doesn't prescribe, if you will, that you have to use a JSON web token. So this is what a JSON web token looks like. It's basically a, a Base64 encoded string. In fact, it's three Base64 encoded strings separated by a dot. Does anyone not know what Base64 encoding is? Great, I don't need to spend any time talking about that. So a JSON web token is made up of three parts. Firstly, you've got the header. 
and then you've got the payload, and then you've got the signature. Okay, so the signature is important because this token is not encrypted. It's signed, but it's not encrypted. So I said it's Base64 encoded. You could, by the way, this is just gibberish. This isn't a real uh, Base64 encoded string. It wouldn't fit on the screen if it was. Um, but if you're using a real uh, uh, JSON web token, you could actually put that through a Base64 decoder and you would actually be able to read the raw JSON that's in there. Um, and that's what it looks like. You have the header. In the header here, we have the algorithm. As I said, it's not encrypted, but it's signed. That's the signing algorithm. And we've got the type, which is a JSON web token. Then you've got the dot that separates it from the payload. And then you've got the payload. So the payload is the real uh, meat of what a JSON web token is. It's th this is the important part. The payload is made up of what's called claims. So there are some kind of standard claims. There are some well-known claims that aren't necessarily standard, and then you can have custom claims. So the claims that you would you would nearly always have in a token would be the subject, where you, you would always have a subject. Um, you might potentially have the name of the person or the name of the resource. Uh, you would have an expiry, so the token will expire after a certain period of time. What you can do when it expires is you can send someone their JSON web token, which contains your claims. So you never put sensitive data in a claim because, as I said, it's not encrypted, it's human readable. So you, you put your data in your claims, you might give someone this token that expires. You can configure when it expires, a day, a week, an hour, and you give them something called a refresh token. So when they've got a refresh token, it doesn't contain any data, doesn't contain any claims, but before their token runs out or when their token runs out, they send that up to the, the server and say, I, I would like a new JSON web token, and that then gets sent back along with a new refresh token. So yeah, so you would have the expiry, you might have roles, for example, uh, you might have all kinds of, you can have custom claims. So it's just JSON, you can put in anything you want. Then you have another dot separating the next section, and the next section is the signature. So as I said, it's human readable, right? It's, it's just JSON. So I could potentially take this token in my browser, and I could add a claim, I could edit one of these claims, but the signature is effectively, it's a hash of the, of the whole token. It's actually, it's a hash of the payload. Uh, what a lot of people are doing now is hashing the header as well, which is much more secure, uh, which means that if you tamper with it, it can then no longer be verified against the signature. When you send it up to the server, it fails validation. That token is not valid. So as I said, it's not encrypted. You can read it. You don't put sensitive data in there, but it's signed. The signing is, is anti-tamper. It's not protecting that data that's in the token. So what are some of the advantages of JSON web tokens? Well, performance, uh, they're stateless. So if you remember that slide that I showed you how it will work, there's no state maintained by the server. You send your username and password, you get your token, that interaction is, is over. The server doesn't have to do any more work then until it gets another request that it has to validate that claim against. That's good. Uh, that inherently makes them scalable. Um, so because there's not that performance overhead from maintaining state, they're more scalable. They then support single page applications. We're just sending data, we're not sending state. And that means that they, of course, support mobile apps. Well, there's gotta be some downsides, right? There's gotta be some downsides to JSON web tokens. Well, yeah, they don't sound like a tasty treat. Okay, that's not great. Um, they're also vulnerable to something called a lift and shift attack. Now, what this means is that if someone has that token, because it, again, because it's stateless, server's not maintaining a session, that token, if it's valid, can come from anywhere, it can come from anyone. So if someone were to get that token, uh, they could send it to the server and attach it, and they would, have, they would get that data back. Now, this isn't really a huge concern, because the way that tokens are usually dealt with is they're stored in local storage in your browser. Um, if someone has access to your local storage, you've got bigger problems already. Um, but to mitigate this, the way that uh, Auth0, Auth0, by the way, uh, uh, a private company, they don't own uh, JSON web tokens or any of this standard, but they are the biggest contributor to it. And the way that they're defining the best practice for this now is you don't store the token in local storage. You just keep it in memory for the duration of the session, and you store the refresh token. So every time your application starts, it gets a new token. So it's not really that big a deal, but that's, that's the risk with JSON web tokens. All right, let's have a look at how that works. Um, so if I just move across to Visual Studio, and I will look at the next application that I've got, which is, oh, let me just close these off. 
and I'll just start this one up. So this is again the same application, but here I'm doing it as a single page application, so not using MVC. Uh, and I've got a client that I built in Angular, which I will show you now. Uh, and let's just see, let's just see if that will run. It will, obviously. Um, and whilst I'm waiting for that, I might just show you how this gets enabled in here. By the way, if anyone has any questions at any point, uh, just feel free to shout out. Uh, we don't you need were saying that the um, JSON web token is vulnerable to all different shift. Yep. How is the refresh token not uh, vulnerable in the same way? Um, well, I mean, it is. It is. It's, uh, it is. Um, the risk is lower. Uh, the risk is considered lower because it doesn't contain any data. It doesn't contain anything relevant. It can just be used to be issued a new token. Yeah, yeah. So just to clarify the question, um, sorry, one second. The question that Liam asked me then was if the, the token is vulnerable to a lift and shift, what is it about the, the refresh token that makes it less vulnerable? The reality is it isn't. So um, so as I was saying earlier, the way that, that Auth0 are doing it now as a best practice is to not store the token in memory uh, and just store the refresh token. Yeah, uh, from technically I suppose it is better um, it, because there's only one thing that's vulnerable to being attacked then and not two. But realistically, anything that's stored in your browser local storage, if it's vulnerable, if someone's got it, they've got it, you know, they've got you. Did you have a question? Oh, yeah, so doesn't isn't local storage um, vulnerable to cross site as well? Uh, so what's your name, sorry? Joseph. Joseph. So Joseph was asking, isn't local storage vulnerable to uh, cross site uh, forgery as well? Um, I don't think so. Um, I mean, it may be if, if there are ways and means it could be. So if you had something, no, because you would have to you would have to write some malicious code that you would then execute, that you would, you'd you still have to take control of the session in order to then get access to the local storage. So I don't think so. I could be wrong, but I, I don't think so, and I think because of that reason. It can be read through JavaScript, though. Yes, it, it, it can, um, but uh, so uh, Joseph was just saying local storage can be read from JavaScript, of course, that's that's how it's gonna work in this in this demo that you're gonna see shortly, but the the local storage is associated with that application. So, so you would have to be able to hijack the session in order to get access to that application, which you can't do if there's no session, right? A again, I I'm not going to put my hand up and say that is 100% correct, and I may be wrong. Um, but, but as far as I'm aware, that that's what protects it from that. Uh, given the uh, given the the discussions we, we, which we just had, uh, isn't it um, like the use case for this JWT would not be just server to server kind of an integration where the server both the sides are secure? And um, so, what's your name, sorry? Nikoj. Nikoj. Yeah. Um, so uh, the question from Nikoj was. Um, would the case for the token not just be server to server communication where both sides are already secure? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Yes, uh, that is a use case. So it's certainly user authentication when you want to protect resources that users have access to. But also, yes, server-to-server -server communication. We're going to talk about that a bit later on as well. So there's actually something called OpenID Connect, which is a, a part of the OAuth 2 standard. And that allows secure resources to talk to each other and exchange information about a user securely. So yes, that, that's absolutely part of the use case. And uh, I'm really... So this is a very big topic, it's very broad, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything, but uh, uh, there's actually two types of tokens, uh, JSON web tokens, there's an identity token and there's an access token. In these demos this evening, I'm using one token to do both, but a, a more secure way of doing it, more secure way of doing it, is when your authority gives you a token, it doesn't give you, it doesn't give you claims that give you everything that you can do. So in, in again, I'm not gonna talk about it this evening, but there's something called scopes, um, and most of the OAuth standard is built on scopes, and that's what you can access. I'm looking at claims, and with claims, I'm going to be talking about roles a bit because I showed you the nurse and doctor. Um, but in your in your ID token, you wouldn't have any of that if you if you're doing it really secure. You would just have an ID, and then when you want to access a resource, the ID token would then be sent up to the authority. The authority says, "Here's the access token that corresponds to the user that, that ID token represents." 
and that access token defines or can be interpreted by by the server, the API, whatever, to interpret what resources it can give that user access to. Does that does that make sense? It's kind of kind of yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like I said, it's a bit out of scope of it, it, it but but the brief answer to your question is yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got this demo up and running now, but uh, before I dive into it, let's just have a quick look at what I've done differently. Here. So, if we look at my startup, I've had to add a couple of bits and pieces here. I've added this uh, Microsoft Identity Model Tokens. It's a NuGet package, but it is it is uh, it is a Microsoft NuGet package. It's open source, and the biggest contributor to this NuGet package is Auth0. Um, but it's a, it's a Microsoft token uh, uh, package. Uh, we've also got this JWT bearer package here as well, and I'm going to use those in this example. So uh, if I have a look at what I've done here, again, in my middleware in startup, I've under where I uh, add my context, my DB context, I've added default identity here. I haven't changed that, but what I have done is added default token providers. It's default. Um, then I've got add authentication. Um, and here I'm using, again, default stuff. I haven't done anything funny with this. It's all just out the, out the box. JWT bearer defaults, JSON web token. Uh, and then here I'm adding the JWT bearer and I'm configuring the options. Here I'm getting the uh, options statically from my app settings.json. So here is my configuration. There's the issuer, the audience, and my signing key. As I said, it's signed, so you 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 want to you know use something better than replace this with a GUID. You would probably want to use a GUID. Um, you don't. You certainly don't want to hard code it here. It's better to put it here. This actually isn't that good either. You might want to put it into your build pipelines. You might want to do it as an environment variable. Better yet, you might want to use Azure Key Vault. Um, but you do need to protect that because if that becomes compromised. Uh, someone can then tamper with your tokens. Uh, another good practice is to actually rotate that key periodically. Um, uh, yeah, uh, you know, some services will rotate it very frequently. You can you can do that if you want to. Uh, that's it. That's all I've had to do. That's all I've changed here uh, to make this work with JSON Web Tokens. Um, the other thing that I did was I added API controllers. Um, because it was MVC, I'm now no longer sending views. Uh, and I've added, as well as my uh, my controllers that are going to give me the data relevant to the medications management, I've added this auth one. And in this auth controller here, I do have an allow anonymous method here, which is login. That needs to be anonymous because <laughs> you're log in, right? You, you know, you, if you have to be logged in to log in, you can't log in. And yeah. Okay, so that's up and running now. So I'll just show you what that looks like. Uh, I'm going to use Postman here, hopefully. You can see that. So um, I'm here. I'm hitting my uh, my endpoint, my auth login endpoint. Uh, I've got a, a basically just a JSON object that I'm sending in, which has a username, which is an email address, and a password here, which is a really super secure password that I told you guys about earlier. Um, so let's send that through to the server. And I don't know if you can see that here. I got a response of a 200 OK. And here's my token that it sent me. So we have here a JSON web token. Um, and as I said, you could put that into a base64 decoder and you could read the contents of that. There's actually a couple of tools uh, online that make it easier to do that for you. There's one here called jwt.ms. Um, this is Microsoft's JSON web token decoder. There's one from Auth0 as well, obviously, um, jwt.io. Um, I use the Microsoft one because it's it's cleaner. Um, I just you know prefer this. So I'm going to paste that in there, and you can see it's decoded it. Um, and here we've got the header in red. The subject here is my email address. Uh, we've got a few other claims. We've got the expiry date, the issuer, and the audience, and then the signature. Because the signature is encrypted, it's signed, you can't read that. Um, but OK, that works. We've got a token back. Um, so I should be able to log in. Let's have a look. So I'm just opening up my uh, my little Angular single page application here. Again, because I'm not using MVC anymore, uh, I can actually do this, and I can build something that probably looks a little bit nicer than what we saw with MVC. Uh, now, oh, okay, I've got one of those funny function keys where uh, 
by default, if you press it, it doesn't do the, the function key function. It does the extra thing that's printed on it. So a few times when I've done this, I've actually put my laptop to sleep. So I'm glad it didn't happen that time. <laughs> okay, so let's log in. So I'm going to log in here with that same user. Uh, nurse at sswmedical.com. Nurse password one, which you didn't hear me say. Okay, cool. And we're logged in. So I'm just going to zoom in here on the console. So I've just... You would obviously, in the real world, never log usernames and passwords to the console. I'm just doing that here to show you. And I've also logged my token. So we can see we got the token. Um, and if I just go back to jwt.ms, let's pop that in there. Um, great, it's decoded it. That all works. Awesome. OK, so if I go back to my application here, um, we can see that I've got the patients. Great. Medications, let's view the medications. I've got paracetamol. Let's add another one. Who can think of a medication? I'm going to put cetirizine. Uh, this is an antihistamine that's available over the counter. Uh, I'm putting that because I have hay fever, so I might want that sometime. Great, that's in there. That's been added. No dramas there. Um, prescriptions. OK, we've got no prescriptions. Let's add one. Uh, OK, so let's see if we can add the paracetamol. Mm, okay. That doesn't seem to be paracetamol. Oh no, because that's a patient. Okay, Adam. Adam's a patient. Paracetamol and uh, 500 milligrams. That's an innocuous dose, right? That's not harmful. Add. Failed. Okay, 403, we've got a 403. 403, unauthorized. Forbidden. Okay, so unauthorized actually, uh, sorry, 403 forbidden, okay? So the HTTP status code 403, which is forbidden, actually means unauthorized, and the HTTP status code 401, unauthorized, actually means unauthenticated. So remember identity, authentication, authorization. Okay, so we're not authorized because I'm logged in as a nurse, right? So, and remember I had that authorized roles equals doctors. Let's just see what happens if I log back in as a doctor. Doctor at sswmedical.com. Uh, log in. Okay, cool. Let's just see if I can, there's no prescriptions as we know. Uh, patient Adam, medication, paracetamol, Dose, 500 milligrams, yeah? Cool. Done. Okay, so that worked. And uh, if I just grab the, oh, if I just grab this token here, we'll just have another look uh, at what's in this token. And we can see here, there we can see I'm the nurse. Okay, cool. All right, well, that's all good so far, right? That wasn't a particularly good experience though, was it? Because when I was a nurse, I could go to the prescriptions here and I could view all this stuff and I could click add, but it didn't let me do it. So there's gotta be a better way than that, right? Well, let's have a look. Sorry, was there a question back there? Nope, cool. All right, so if we have a look at this auth controller, we go down here, we can see that when I generate the token, so, sorry, this login method here, when you log in, you send up that, that DTO, which I showed you in Postman there, was just an email address and a password. Uh, and you get a sign in result. I call a method here calling generate token async. So I did actually write this method. But again, there's nothing in here that I'm doing that's fancy. Uh, I, it's JWT security token. I didn't create that. That comes again out of that Nougat, Nougat package. Uh, and I'm adding some roles here. So I'm adding some roles here, and they're getting added as claims, and then generating the token, and I'm sending it back. All right, so how does that work this side? Well, in my single page application here, um, if I have a look at my login component, uh, you just log in. Um, by the way, sorry, this is an Angular, as I said, this is an Angular single page application here, so I am gonna gloss over this a little bit. Um, this calls a service, which is a user service. Um, and again, using this, I basically send, 
I send those details up to the server here, uh, and then when I get the token back, I save it in local storage, which is this line here. Okay, so let's see if there's a better way of doing that where we can actually use those roles on the, on the client side as well. So I have got another version of this set up here, which is more or less the same, except as you can see here, it's called role guard. So this one has a role guard built into it as well. Uh, so again, this is a, a bit off topic here, but I'm using something called can activate that's added to my router in, in Angular. And basically I'm calling here and saying, if the role, if the role in the token payload is not equal to the expected role on that route, uh, revert them back to this unauthorized page, or you know, otherwise let them go ahead. Um, and that's just done here. I've just added this role guard service onto my route here. And uh, for this route, which is for adding prescriptions, I've said the expected role is doctor. And for this role here, which is administering medications, I've said that the expected role is nurse. So I'm just going to fire that off. Are there any questions so far? Good stuff. Now, let's just have another look at that token while we're waiting for that. So I'm just going back to JWTMS. Has anyone spotted any problems so far? There's no role. There's no role. Okay. Well, actually, oh, it's here. Okay. So the way that uh, the way that JSON, JSON Web Tokens work is, as I said earlier, there is something called a standard claim. Uh, there are some standard and well-known claims, and then there's something called a custom claim. So the OAuth standard doesn't define roles at all. So roles, any kind of role is a custom claim. So anytime you're using a role in your token, that's a custom claim. So the OAuth standard, again, doesn't prescribe, but strongly suggests as a best practice that custom claims are prefixed with something called a namespace. And that's this. So a namespace uh, can be anything. Here, it's a Microsoft schema. So again, showing you where I add my claims here in my token in the, in the API, Microsoft does that automatically for you. So you can configure that, you can override that, but at the moment, our roles look like that. Okay, well, let's see, let's see how our client application handles that. Uh, let's close that one off and open a new one. Uh, I'm opening a new in private window here every time. Uh, can anyone guess why? Correct, yeah, because otherwise it's in the local storage. Okay. So let's open up the console. Uh, I'm just gonna log in. Uh, okay, so I'm logged in as nurse. I'm logging in as nurse. Okay, we got the token, we're logged in. I'll just check that I can still see my patient. Yeah, there's Adam. Um, I can view the medications. I can view the prescription. There's the paracetamol that I prescribed him earlier, but when I try and prescribe it, okay, doesn't let me in. By the way, I stole this off CodePen, that's not mine, so <laughs> can't take credit for that. Uh, okay, cool, so that, w that works. That's what we're expecting, okay? so. Now, when I log in as a doctor, doctor password one, nice and secure, log in. We can see all the things, we can see the prescriptions, and when I add the prescription, I get the same thing. I get the same problem. And I'm just gonna zoom in here on the console. So right down here at the bottom, uh, I've got my role guide that I told you about earlier, logging. And you can see here, expected role is doctor. The actual role is under undefined, and that's because, as Liam said, uh, I'm looking for a role of doctor. Again, if I go back to my route guard here, I'm looking for a role of doctor. What I'm getting is this namespaced claim here. If it just said role, it would work. Okay, maybe there's something we can do about that. I'm going to come back to that a bit later on. So there might be there might be a way we can fix that up. 
But uh, yeah, so that in a nutshell is how JSON web tokens work. Uh, any questions about that so far? Still pretty easy. We're still not doing anything particularly difficult, right? It's all out the box stuff. Uh, everyone feel confident? Who's done all this before? Uh, most of you, right? It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so just a quick recap about the signing key. Uh, as I said, you know, you don't want to hard code it. Better yet, in your app settings, even better, environment variable, build pipeline, but best yet, Azure Key Vault, right? If that's for the win. Okay, so so far we've had a look at uh, an MVC app uh, using sessions and cookies. We've had a look at the same app, but as a single page application using JSON web tokens. Um, and I'm still handling that authorization and authentication with my API. It's all built into my API. So what are some other options? You can outsource it, okay? You can outsource it to someone else or you can outsource it to another service that you build yourself. Well, how would that work? So you might remember me earlier mentioning the word authority. So an assigning authority is someone that issues a token and validates it. That doesn't have to be your API, okay? So the way that that works is it starts, as it always starts, with a username and password. So you send your username and password to an authority. This authority generates a JSON web token. It sends you the JSON web token, and now, you make your HTTP request or whatever it is to access your protected resource and you send it with the JSON web token. Your protected resource, which in this case is an API, sends that token to the authority and says, is that token valid? The authority says yes or no, and then it's all over. Uh, but it says yes, and the API says, cool, here's your data, uh, and then you render it locally. That's nice, right? So why might you, is there a question at the back? Stretching your wrist? Cool. All right. So what might be some reasons that you want to do this? Um, one of them would be clean architecture. Uh, by the way, who here is, is going to the clean architecture superpowers? Cool. Who Who's heard of it? Yeah? So you guys don't know about this. I suggest you look this up. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, I'm not going to bang on about it now, but if you've got any questions, look on SSW TV, look on the SSW website. Uh, but this is this is Jason Taylor from, from SSW. He will explain um, uh, what clean architecture is, how you separate out the different bits of your application to do the different things that they're supposed to do. So you can move, you know, from a clean architecture perspective, you don't want your API and everything just, just doing the one thing and you know, all of it, the one thing doing all the things, right? So you want to move it somewhere else. And that can be just another uh, service that you run yourself, you can outsource it to some some third parties. Uh, I mentioned Auth0 earlier. We're going to look at B2C in a minute as well. Uh, that's Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure AD B2C. So that's one reason. Um, another reason is risk, right? So security is a hot topic. Uh, you know, if you're doing security and authentication, that means anytime there's a vulnerability disclosed, anytime that there's there's any kind of uh, flaw in the security uh, that you're using, you have to update that, right? Now, of course, as good developers, we all keep our packages up to date all the time anyway, right? You know, if there's a bug, a flaw, we keep them up to date. But the point is, you, do, you still have to do that. There's no getting away from that. But if you take a part of that that's a really important part from a security perspective and give it to someone else, that then becomes their problem and you're, you're decreasing the surface area of things that you're responsible for. Because, you know, if there's a problem with security, lots of things can go wrong. You know, nobody wants to end up on this guy's website, yeah? No one wants to get shamed by Troy Hunt. That would just be bad, yeah? As I said, security, it's a hot topic. You know, like, granted, a couple of years ago, it was much bigger. Uh, February 2018, there was the Notifiable Data Breaches Scheme that came in. Does anyone remember, th remember that? This was an extension to the Privacy Act. This came into effect in February 2018, which meant that if you had a security breach under certain circumstances, you're legally mandated to report that potentially publicly, certainly to the uh, Office of the Information Commissioner. They had a similar scheme in New Zealand. I think it was called the Breached As scheme. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's say you've decided to outsource uh, your authentication. What are your options? Well, you can, you can use ASP.NET Core. Um, everything that I've showed you so far is ASP.NET Core. I'm not using anything fancy. Uh, and it just works out the box. But what you can do is you can take that out of your API put it in another service layer. Um, you can even, do you remember what I said earlier about having an authority that's separate? 
if you've got multiple applications, you know, and you want to have a single sign-on, you want to have one identity that can access all of those, you could have uh, as you could have something running that you build using ASP.NET Core that just issues and signs and validates tokens, and you can have your multiple applications all authorizing against that, all authenticating against that, um, and that gives you your single sign-on experience. And again, it said you know. Just out of the box, it makes it nice and easy. Yeah, let's say, for example, you want to build the next Atlassian and you want people to log into your Bitbucket and your Jira and, and all the other things that, that um, Francis, is it the front here? Uh, never wants to hear me talk about again. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, or you might want to build a, a you know nice company that makes nice things, I don't know. But you, you know, that's the reason why you might do that. So you can do it with ASP.NET Core. Um, it's free, right? You're using your existing skill set. Um, some of the downsides, though, is uh, it is internally owned risk still. You don't get the benefits of making it someone else's problem. Um, and there are no, I've said here there's no client SDKs. What I mean by that is there's no client libraries. There are no native client libraries for ASP.NET Core authentication. There is something from Microsoft called the Microsoft Authentication Library. That's a wrapper for all of Microsoft's authentication protocols, methods, techniques, endpoints. They're all wrapped up in this one package. Um, but the other options we're going to look at actually have client libraries specific for them. There's also no built-in user flows. So by that, I mean, remember my M MVC app? I showed you a login page and a register page. I didn't build those. I didn't, they're out of the box. When I showed you the single page application, I had the login page. I had to build that. Okay, Not a big deal, but you also have to do things like password reset, email verification, um, all those other things as well. So uh, that's one of the downsides. You have to build that yourself. So another option, identity server. Uh, who here has heard of identity server? Who here has used identity server? Who here is using identity server? Yeah, yeah. Identity server is good. I like it. Um, it gives you. It's free. You know. Um, it's got those user flows built in. Unlike some of the other options we're going to look at, it doesn't force you to use those build those user flows. So you could still build your own login, uh, password reset, um, sign up, all that stuff if you want to. Um, I say new skill set, I mean it's all part of the same thing, but it is a whole other thing that you now have to uh, look after. Um, it's an additional management overhead, um, so you do still have to keep it up to date, like I said, um, and support is paid, so you have to pay for support. Um, so it's, not, it, it's free to use, um, but if you have any problems you have to buy support. So Auth0, I've mentioned Auth0 a lot. Who here is using Auth0? Who here has used Auth0? Okay, Auth0 is nice. Um, Auth0 have contributed most of, uh, of the code to, uh, and the specification to OAuth and OAuth2. Um, it's free for up to 7,000 users a month. If you're just doing logins, it's very easy to use. Um, in fact, other than just you know setting up out the box with ASP.NET Core, it's probably the easiest. Um, it does have the user flows, and it has client libraries. It has client libraries for Java, JavaScript, .NET, a few other things. So those client libraries are all there. Um, the downside of Auth0 is that the core features are not available on that free tier. Um, so the, the stuff that's other than just logging people in, like you remember we've got the doctor and the nurse. You can't do that on the free tier. Actually, sorry, you can now. Um, you used to not be able to, but you can now. Um, but it's not easy. It's not easy like just doing the login stuff. It's not as easy as it is doing with .NET. What else? Azure AD B2C. Azure AD B2C is free for 50,000 users a month. So if you are building a consumer-facing application that you just need people logging in with, this is probably a good option. Um, and also, by the way, sorry, um, with Auth0, once you go over that free tier, it does get quite expensive quite quickly, whereas uh, with Azure AD B2C, it's much more of an incremental step in the pricing. It has the built-in user flows. Um, so the login, sign up, email verification, forget password, that's all built in. It's Azure integrated, uh, which means that if you're building an enterprise application that's going to be managed and owned by an internal IT department, they like it. Um, it does have some limited functionality. That's the built-in functionality. It is extensible. You can do quite a lot with it, and we're probably going to have a look at that. Um, but in terms of what it does out of the box, it, it's 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 limited. Uh, depending on your skill set, you may find it easier to extend that functionality in B2C than you do in uh, Auth0. With either of them, you can you can extend that functionality in a number of ways. 
but with Azure AD B2C, you can use your existing .NET skills, which you can't really do with Auth0. You would have to use, for, again, for the extensibility stuff, you would have to use an entirely different skill set. Uh, what else? Okta. Who's using Okta? <laughs> Did you shake your head in horror? Um, well, look, it, there are some pluses to Okta. Uh, the, the enterprise support is, is excellent. Um, it's got extensive integrations and connectors with uh, uh, with enterprise applications. So if you are building something that you are intending to sell to enterprise customers, saying that you have an existing Okta integration is likely to be a good selling point for you. In reality, it's not going to make any difference because Okta will integrate with anything, as will all the other things that we've seen using that OpenID Connect standard we mentioned earlier. Um, but you know, a lot of, a lot of companies might you know not know that, and they might see it as part of their evaluation criteria. Oh, well, we're using Okta in the enterprise single sign-on enterprise product. We've already got it. They integrate with it. That might be a reason to go with Okta. Downside, yeah, it's expensive. In fact, it's very expensive. In fact, it's very, 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 very <laughs> expensive. Um, I could fill up a few more slides with dollar signs for Okta. It's 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 not cheap. Um, Others, there are some other options. Um, AWS have got a, a, what's called Identity as a Service. Um, IBM have got one as well. Uh, there's one called One Login, BMC, etc. There's a, there are other options. Okay, who here is using any other options that I haven't mentioned? No, look, they're the main ones. Okay, but there are others. Um, and you know what? If you want to, we can go all the way back here. And you can build your own if you want to, if you want to compete with those things. So there are, there are others, but those are the main ones. Um, well, let's have a look at one of those. Let's have a look at B2C. Okay, so I am just going to close all this off. And I'm going to bring in the B2C client which is here, and I will walk you through this shortly. And I'm also going to fire up the version of the API that runs on B2C. Just close all these off. Um, so I'm just starting up this one. I'll fire that up. And while we're waiting for that, I'll show you what changes I had to make to this to get it to work. So obviously the first thing that you've got to do is actually set up uh, B2C as, in the Azure side, in the Azure portal. So you guys all have uh, Azure tenants, right? Yeah. If you've already got an Azure tenant, you can do B2C. If you haven't got one, you can create one for free, and B2C will work for up to 50,000 users a month for free, right? Doesn't it, you know? It's a pretty good offer, <laughs> um, much more generous than the others. So as I said, there are packages available for this. I had to add in this NuGet package here. Again, it's NuGet package, it's free, you just install it, Azure AD B2C. Uh, and then I replaced all this code that I showed you here earlier with that. That's pretty easy, right? I mean, it doesn't get much easier than that. I think, I think that's pretty easy. Um, cool. Okay. Well, that's all I had to do on that side. Again, I'm pulling in options here. Um, at, at the moment, again, I've got those in my app settings to adjacent here. So I've got my, my B2C config there. Uh, I'm going to close that off because it's not really that relevant because in your case, you will be getting those values out of Azure Key Vault, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So in the client side, um, I had to make some changes here. I added a B2C service. Um, if I'm in the right one, I did. Um, I may have, in fact, updated my user service. Uh, I had to import some packages here. Again, I'm using the Microsoft Authentication Library. Um, you can just install it by, by NPM. You can see that up here, the mCell. So I'm pulling in that mCell Angular library there. Um, and I'm just calling methods that are built in. So I mean, again, I'm, I'm I, I had to write some of this code, but everything that you're going to see, I didn't do. It, it's all out of the box. Um, I did have to configure it. So the same way I had configuration um, in the API, I had to put some conf configuration here as well. There is documentation. Um, there is documentation available that will uh, not actually show you how to do any of this because the documentation is awful. 
unfortunately. Um, Azure B2C, in fact, pretty much anything from Microsoft is incredibly easy to use. You, you know, you'll spend 70% of your time deciphering the documentation. All of my, yeah, right? Microsoft documentation, they make it seem much harder than it is. But this is really easy. Um, okay, so on the Azure side, let's get rid of this. Uh, on the Azure side, I've got my B2C portal. Um, uh, I had to create an application. Uh, it's just loading, it's a bit slow. So I've got an application ID here. Um, there are some user flows. I did have to do a little bit of configuration here, um, but you know, I effectively just did new user flow. This is out of the box, and there's some company branding. I can I can open a logo. Um, cool, uh, and I can manage my users from here as well. I hope. Okay, all right. Well, let's see what that looks like. Oh, am I actually running my client? No, I might want to start it. Whilst we're waiting for that, let's see what happens. A really nice feature of, of Azure B2C is that you can test everything within the Azure B2C portal. So if I go to my user flow here, go to my sign up and sign in flow, I can actually go run user flow. What's more, in my read reply URL, I can actually set it to go to JWT MS and it will send the token directly to JWT MS for me. Uh, and then I can look at it and decode it. Um, when you're doing OAuth, you do have to specify where when you're using something like uh, Azure BTC or Auth0, you have to specify a reply URL. They will enforce you using HTTPS across your applications. Um, and that's because that reply URL doesn't get sent over the internet, it just comes back to your browser and then gets redirected from your browser to where you want it to go. So my client application will redirect to Azure B2C, I'll get my token that comes back via the browser. Okay, so that's why it has to be has to be HTTPS across the board. Um, so let's just run this now. So uh, as I said, I've got some branding there. I, I didn't have to, I haven't customized this at all. All I've done is loaded in a logo. Uh, but let's just sign up. Uh, and I'm going to use this uh, Gmail account that I've set up here for this. Uh, let's just log in, uh, zoom in a bit. Uh, so the email address is ssw.medman.doctor <coughs> at gmail.com. So then I'm going to get it to send a verification code. And again, I don't have to do this. Bless you, Adam. Um, I, I don't have to build this. Um, this is out of the box. This is B2C just does this for me. Um, so let's go and have a look in my mailbox. Fortunately, um, that code has come through straight away. Uh, there was an issue a couple of weeks ago where there was a delay of about six hours with getting those verification codes in. Um, but fortunately, we don't have that problem now. So that code is verified. I'm going to add in my password. Of course, you'll be using a password manager in real life, right? Uh, Give a name, SSW tester. And I'm going to self-assert my job title here as nurse. Create. OK, cool. So it sent this token. Um, cool, we've got the token. Great. Um, what have we got here? We've got an expiry. We've got the header, a version, the issuer, um, my name, my given name, my family name. Awesome. So it's given me all that. OK, so go back to my client application. Again, in an in private window. Uh, now this time, when I hit log in, uh, it's actually going to fire off that B2C login, which looks like this. So I'm zoomed in a bit here, which has uh, made it not look the nicest. But you can see here that that's just that same same page we saw before. Uh, so I'll log in with that account I just created. Okay, so I'm logged in, I have my token, um, I can see my patients. Cool, there's Adam, I can see the, the medications. Uh, and okay, I can prescribe, but I did log in as a nurse, so we don't expect that to work right now. Okay, in fact, in fact, we wouldn't expect that to work even if my role was doctor, right? Because if I go back to B2C, okay, great, I've got the job title, but where's my role? So if I look at my user attributes, 
There's no role. Okay, not ideal, right? Not ideal. Well, as I said, Azure B2C is, is actually extensible. So you don't have to use those built-in user flows. You can create your own. If I go to this uh, identity experience framework here, I've got my custom policies. Okay, so the way that these work is you download some XML from Microsoft. They, again, you get it from their GitHub. You download the templates for these. The XML defines the, the flow and the steps and the process. It doesn't define the UI. You can change the UI. You can everything that I showed you is, is what, what's in the box from B to C. You can create custom HTML and CSS. You store that in static storage somewhere. You tell B to C to get your templates from that static storage, and that will give you some nicely more customized login screens. Um, but you don't have to use those. You can use the built-in ones. And these here effectively just uh, just change that step and that process. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at what happens when I do that. Uh, in fact, let me just make sure. Yeah, OK. So these are the custom policies. And if I just open up this sign up and sign in, uh, what's happening here uh, again, I'm not going to spend too much time going into this. There are There is docu documentation available from Microsoft, uh, which doesn't explain very well how this works. But I will. I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll write a blog post about this, explaining how you do it. Don't have much time now. The first thing I had to do was in the claim schema, I had to define a custom claim type. Do you remember I said that roles are not a standard claim type? They're a custom claim type? Great. So I've defined one called role. OK? And then. Uh, I've got a step down here, this REST API one, where I'm calling an Azure Functions webhook, and I am sending it an input claim of job title. Do you remember I self-asserted my job title? I'm sending it this job title of uh, nurse in this case, and I'm getting back a claim type of role. So I've got um, my claim type, and I've got my partner claim type. So I could send it job title. It might be called job role, the place I'm sending it. Um, and I'm getting back something called role, and I'm getting it's called role where it's coming from. They might send me something back called um, permission, and I might choose to store that in a claim called role. So that's why it's called a claims exchange. Um, in this case, I've written an Azure function to do that. Uh, you might not. You might want to have a user database uh, that, especially if you're building your own authority, you might have an authority somewhere that, that when someone logs in, depending on what the scope is, depending on what application they're looking for access to, you might send them a role that's relevant to that. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, if you've got Okta, you can actually do a claims exchange with Okta. You know, there's all kinds of ways you can do it. Um, okay, cool. Let's just stop that and let's see how we can access that. Oh, uh, yeah, I could show you the, the, the Azure Web Function. I'm not going to, though, because it's not that relevant. Um, all right, so how do we make it work? Well, if I go into my config here, this is where I'm telling it what user flow, what sign-in flow to use. If I go back to B2C, I've got a custom one here. I'm actually going to tell it to use that instead. OK, that should be pretty straightforward. That's it. That's all I need to do on the API side, so I'll just fire that back up. Over on my client side, I've got to do the same thing here, um, and this is oh, this is actually all just done in the URL. So I'm just going to tell it to use that one as well. All right, let's fire this one up as well. And whilst we're waiting for that, we can also test it. Uh, let's get rid of that. We can test it here just like we could uh, with the built-in one. So I'm going to send it to jwt.ms. Run now. Okay, now I've got a slightly different login screen, but again, I haven't really customized this much. SSW.medman.doctor at gmail.com. Uh, I'll put in my password, sign in, and that should hopefully give me a token and redirect me to jwt.ms. There's my token. And now, if I look at my claims, I've got a role of nurse. So now we actually have a role that's just in a claim called role. We haven't seen that before. So if I go back to my client app, 
and local host. I'll just bring up the console so we can see what's happening. Login ssw.medman.doctor at gmail.com. Okay, I'm logged in. It's given me a token here. Uh, so I'll just make sure everything's working. Okay, I'm getting data back from the API. That means that the flow that I'm using to log in is the same flow that's protecting the API. They have to match. That's all working. Um, if I go to my prescriptions, okay, we did see the role was nurse, so that should still not work. Okay, no worries. What we can do now is go back to the B2C portal. And if I go to users, I should be able to find that test account I created. Uh, and here, where I've got the job title of nurse, I'm going to change that to say doctor. Save that. And if I log back in now, ssw.medman.doctor at gmail.com password ah, type my password wrong as I said you'll be using a password manager in real life right so you won't ever get this problem okay I'm logged in I've got a new token I can see the patients I can see the medications, I can see the prescriptions, and now because I'm a doctor, I can prescribe medications. Let's just try that again. Did I put myself, I've still just got Adam. Uh, let's give him some cetirizine. He was sneezing earlier, so he probably needs this. Uh, give him a 500 milligram dose, add, and that all works. Okay, awesome. So we have gone from, we've gone from having a session cookie, uh, sessions and cookies, then we've moved to OAuth, we've had tokens, We've seen how, with those tokens, they're namespaced with the roles. Roles are a custom claim, they're not a standard claim. Uh, and then we've gone through using those roles on the client side, but then they're not working because of the custom claim, because of the namespace. I've then gone to B2C, Azure B2C, and I've used the claims exchange to customize that login process to give me a custom role, which then allows me to give a better user experience because then on the client side, you don't just get a failure from your API, you can actually control it at the route level and you can only give people access to the things that they're supposed to access. So we've gone from the old school way to the new school way. And personally, I'm quite happy with how that turned out. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for coming. Um, if there's any questions, please let me know if anyone wants to ask anything. So uh, the question was from Sarah. Yes. Uh, the question from Sarah is, can I give a brief overview of OpenID Connect? Uh, yep, so uh, I didn't really have time to dive into OpenID Connect, um, but uh, OpenID Connect is, is, is a part, it's a fundamental part of the OAuth 2 standard. Um, what that actually lets you do is it allows resources that are protected. It allows an authority that a user can authenticate against to protect resources in another authority. So it allows you to securely exchange information about a user. What that means, for ex example, is if, let's say, let's continue this example, right? So I've got a doctor that can log in, I've got a nurse that can log in. Let's say I'm a patient and I want to log in and see what I'm prescribed as a patient. I might want to sign up with Facebook or Twitter or Google. I've already got those accounts. So using OpenID Connect, I can actually log in, register with that with my Google account, and then when I log in, I can just sign in with that. And I don't have to sign up again with a new username and password that I have to remember separately. That is fundamentally single sign-on. So single sign-on is using one identity to access multiple resources. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, all of this code will be online. It's not at the moment because it needs a little bit of cleaning up, but it will all be on GitHub. So keep an eye on SSW's Twitter. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know when that's available. I'll also um, write some blog posts that will explain how that works, and I will include uh, OpenID Connect in there. Um, another thing, uh, I didn't go over Auth0. Auth0 will be in there. One of the really great things about the old MVC days is Windows Auth. So Windows Auth will be in there as well. You'll be able to see how that works. So that'll all be in there. And I'll write some blog posts to explain it as well that will hopefully be a bit clearer than the Microsoft documentation, although I think it would be pretty hard not to be. <laughs> you always submit a board question.
You can. So, so the comment from Liam there is that you can submit a pull request. So I don't know if you guys know, but um, all of Microsoft documentation is now on GitHub. So you can actually submit pull requests to approve it if you want to. So, so the question was, uh, is a lift and shift attack similar to a man in the middle attack? And uh, no, no, it's not. So it, it, it's so a man in the middle attack uh, cross site. Uh, request forgery is more like a man in the middle. A man in the middle is where someone intercepts your communication, grabs the data, and then uses it maliciously. Um, that's why, as I said, you have to use HTTPS for your redirect so that someone can't do a man in the middle. Lift and shift is, is man not in the middle. They're, that man is actually at your end, right? They're literally not in the middle. They're, they're where you are. Thank you.